Okay, so thank you everybody for your patience. Hopefully uh, the planner's presentation is up and running. Over to you, James. Thank you, Chair. Can I double check that members are able to see the presentation? It should be showing slide 14 at the minute, which is viewpoint seven. It is, it is. Perfect, and uh, just apologies for that glitch there. Um, so yes, uh, viewpoint seven is a minor road near Pitcullen. So this is approximately 2.2 kilometers west of the development site or the nearest turbine um, and is a key view for localized landscape impacts. Um, again, it's the scale of the turbines over the ridge line would be the uh, main feature here. Slide 15 shows viewpoint eight, um, which is um, located 6.2 kilometers to the nearest turbine and is southeast of the development site. Um, and again, it is uh, the turbines are prominent along the extent of the Hill Affair Ridge. Slide 16 shows viewpoint nine, um, and this is 9.2 kilometers uh, from turbine 16. So this is taken from the southeast again, and similar to before, we have the turbines centrally, more centrally this time along uh, the Hill Affair Ridge. Slide 17 shows viewpoint 10. This is taken from the Geary area, and this is two kilometers from the nearest turbine, um, which is turbine 16, and it's taken from the east. So this is demonstrative of the host landscape character type, and it's a key view for local visual impact upon the Hill of Fair. So this would be similar to the experience of people visiting um, the Hill of Fair location. And we can see the extent of the turbines across um, this locality. Slide 18 shows viewpoint 11, once again taken from within the Geary area. This is 4.2 kilometres northeast of the nearest turbine um, and is a key view for local landscape impacts. So similar to some of those that you've seen before, um, we have the extent of the development across the centre of the Hill of Fair Ridge. Slide 19 shows viewpoint 12 and uh, this would be approximately seven kilometres north of the nearest turbine. and um, we can see um, the existing landscape, the theoretical visibility of the turbines highlighted in red and the photomontage on the bottom there. And we can see that um, from uh, this viewpoint, there is existing landscaping, which provides a degree of screening for um, at least two of the turbines. Slide 20 shows viewpoint 13, this is 8.4 kilometers northwest of the nearest turbine, which is turbine four. And this is a key view for local visual impact upon surrounding hills. And um, we can see that there is some presence of wind energy already within this location, but the introduction of it along the ridge line is a new feature. Slide 21 shows viewpoint 14. This is 9.8 kilometers from turbine five and this is taken from the southwest it's another key view for local visual impact upon the surrounding hills and once again it is that introduction of wind energy along the ridge line which would be the predominant feature at this location <coughs> slide 22 shows viewpoint 15 uh, this is of less relevance to us as a local authority but it's included for completeness this is actually taken within the city council um area um but does show um, how this fits within the wider mm -hmm. landscape. It, as a more distant view, um, the impact is perhaps lesser at this location. Viewpoint 16 is 4.7 kilometers uh, from turbine 15 and is taken from the west of the development site. Um, <clears throat> and again, this is perhaps a reasonable example of existing land, land cover um, landscaping providing a degree of screening, but the turbines are um, rather evident at this location. Slide 24 shows viewpoint 17. This is 3.9 kilometers from turbine five and it is taken from the southwest. Um, again, much as before, it is that uh, prominence of the turbines over the ridge line that would be notable at this location. Slide 25 shows viewpoint 18, um, which is 7.2 kilometers to the west of the nearest turbine. Um, and again, much in the same way, the visibility along the ridge, which is the common factor amongst many of these viewpoints. 
viewpoint 19 is um, 4.8 kilometers to the south. And once again, it is the scale of the turbines. Viewpoint 20 is taken from West Hill, so one within the Geary area. This is approximately 11.5 kilometers from the nearest turbine. So, and this is taken from the northeast of the development site. Um, on the wireframe, we see that within the wider landscape, the turbines are generally visible. And within the photo montage, we do see the turbines over the hill. Um, I would pay attention to the scale of them against the um, surrounding landscape, but we can see that there is energy infrastructure already visible in this location through the overhead lines. Viewpoint 21 is 9.3 kilometers um, from the nearest turbine and taken from the northeast. This is within the Geary area. And again, it is that introduction of wind energy along this ridge line. Well, I suppose more extending the influence, there is theoretical visibility of Federesso in the mid hill one, mid hill two. And, um, but this would bring that development um, closer to this location. Slide 29 shows viewpoint 22, which is the last of the photo montages um, for the landscape and visual impact. This is approximately 3.9 kilometers to the southwest mm -hmm. of the development site. And again, there is the theoretical visibility of the turbines in this location, but there is screening from existing landscaping, which would um, appear to be effective at this location. Um, as the final few slides, we obviously have the reason for objection centered around cultural heritage. So we've included the um, theoretical visibility for the designated cultural heritage assets. Uh, the ones of particular interest to us today are Sun Honey and Christchurch stone circles, which are located um, to the north of the development site um, and the ones which Historic Environment Scotland have raised their concerns over. Um, we have a heritage viewpoint taken from Sun Honey and we can see from this image we have the recumbent stone circle in the uh, center there with the stones flanking it um, there is obviously planting and land landscaping um, in the intervening area historic environment mm -hmm. scotland have mm -hmm. noted that this screening would be would not be effective throughout the entirety of the year um, and so do consider the impact upon uh, the setting of this stone circle to be significant and of national interest. We can see the turbines visible through this and I suppose just as the year progresses that coverage may vary. We do not have a viewpoint taken from Christchurch um, stone circle um, but as these are in close proximity they are rather similar effects. Um, and then we've also got a viewpoint taken from Midmore Castle um, you may have picked up within the report that there were some concerns raised over the impact on the setting of the A-listed Minmar Castle. However, issues with gaining access to the property in order to mm -hmm. um, take visualizations have prevented a more in-depth assessment of it. Historic Environment Scotland have not objected on this ground, more so raised concerns, um, and the council would intend to uh, take a similar approach. The purpose of this viewpoint is to show the impact of the turbines on the approach to Midmar Castle. So this would be um, the northern approach to it. And we can see that the turbines are visible in this location. Um, now that concludes the presentation by way of updates. As I did mention earlier, um, additional information was submitted by the developer at the start of September. The council has been consulted on that, but due to the nature of the information, uh, we are largely reliant upon key consultees, SEPA, Nature Scott, and Historic Environment Scotland responding before we can take a clear position on how that interacts with our reasons for objection. As per the report, we would seek to use delegated powers to um, resolve these issues if the consultees remove their objections. But I will leave that there. Thank you for your patience and um, apologies for the interruption in the middle of this. And I will be happy to take any questions at the appropriate time. OK, thank you, James. So it's now over to councillors uh, to see if you have any questions for the planning officer. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, James. Thank you for the presentation. I've got two questions for you. The first one is with regards to slide two, 
which is in fact shown on the on the screen at the moment. Am I right to understand that the development proposed is there about or more than 50% of the Midmar forest, which it would affect? I do not have that calculation on the top off the top of my head, so I wouldn't be able to confirm that one way or the other. Um, but we can see Midmar Forest obviously located on this slide. Um, the oh. development site itself isn't completely wooded, I would say. Um, there are, are areas of open heathland, and um, for completeness, I would highlight that. Um, Forestry consultation has been undertaken by the Energy Consents Unit as part of this um, proposal. OK, thank you. The second one is, uh, I understand as well that the MOD had uh, entered a representation, an objection. Have they uh, withdrawn it? So to be clear, our position on this was um, when the report was prepared, we had not seen a response from the Ministry of Defence. Nothing had been uploaded on the Energy Consents Unit website. Um, in the throughout the committee process and in preparation for today, a response has been uploaded to the Energy Consents Unit website, where the Ministry of Defence has clarified that they do not hold an objection to the proposal, right. subject to conditions being attached in respect of aviation lighting and notification of um, the works being undertaken to erect the turbines. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Councillor Grant, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, James, for the presentation. Just a, a few sort of more sort of general questions. Um, 16 turbines, 180 uh, metres and 200 metres. Presumably the height is based on, you know, the height of the hill. So the, 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 the taller ones will be in the sort of slope, sloping parts of the, the hill. I couldn't quite make out from the, the blue and pink on your map. Um, and it mentioned seven out of the 16 would require aviation lighting. I just wondered why it was just, just the seven there. Um, another point, uh, again, page 25, 2.2.3, about foundation support. It mentions 4.5 to 5.5 metres above the ground, um, but the final design of each foundation would depend upon ground conditions. And I just wondered, as a developer or, or anyone made any attempt to ascertain the nature of the, the ground conditions that would determine the, the depth of support required. Um, page 27, um, 2.5.2, 2.5.3, um, there's mention that the, the, uh, sorry, the Electricity Works Regulations 2017 states that the, the EIAR if I can get it right, must contain a description of reasonable alternatives. Uh, and then in the next paragraph, it mentions that this hasn't been given. And I just wondered how much, you know, to, to what degree this affects the, the validity of the application. Presumably it hasn't made too much difference since we're um, considering it today. Um, sorry, just a, a couple more points and I'll, I'll finish off. Um, uh, Yes, sorry, the, regarding the, the SEPA holding ob ob objection, which I'm sure other, others will come to, I won't get into other details on that, but it, it mentions, um, you know, the Denecht estate collection tanks lying within 100 metres of construction activity. And I just wondered what, what um, part of the activity that would be nearby, just to, to give an indication there. Um, and I think this... Couple more things, and I'll finish off. D just regarding that, the the fifty years lifespan uh, operational period of the project is that based on you know the the longevity of the components? I just wondered why it was fifty years. And then just finally, um, page forty one six point three point eighteen, um, it mentions it's sixteen point nine kilometers from the Cairn Gorms National Park. Yet elsewhere in the report, it mentions the national park didn't object didn't provide any objections and I just wondered if there was any reason why that was the case. I'll, I'll just leave it for there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quite a lot to go through there. So in terms of the turbine design, um, it's perhaps something that the applicant will be able to um, provide more clarity on if you ask at that stage. Um, however, um, my understanding is that the height of the turbines 
will be driven not just by topographical information, but there is also considerations around, um, I suppose, weather conditions, wind speed, um, what's going to be efficient. So there will be a competing balance within that, but that would be something that the developer would be able to provide more clarity on. It's not generally a discussion that we um, are involved in as part of these kinds of proposals. In terms of the aviation lighting, there is um, quite strict regulation around this, and we are largely guided by the advice of key consultees on this. So that will be the probably um, NATS, the National Air Traffic Service, would be the key figure within that. Um, so the need for um, a certain number of them to be illuminated would really be dictated by their consultation response. Um, and quite often what you will find is that um, discussions around aviation lighting and the final solution that will be arrived upon is something that um, will be subsequent are subject to quite a lot of discussion between the developer and um, those bodies um, while the application is under consideration. Um, they usually can be quite technical solutions there. In terms of the ground conditions, um, there will have been reasonable work carried out as part of this application process. We can see that through, I suppose, the um, geology, hydrogeology um, mm. section of the report. Um, there has been quite a lot of work carried out there. Um, but there will usually be a degree of work to mm -hmm. finalise um, the specifics of the development um, prior to construction, if it gets permission. Um, so this would be through a process called micrositing. Um, so while the developer will, ha will have indicated locations for these turbines, there's usually a limit of deviation that is granted as part of section 36. And um, mm -hmm. so when they talk about further investigation to finalise those details, that would be carried out as part of that micrositing exercise. So in order of events, that's quite normal for an application of this type. So we wouldn't have concerns as a professional service in relation to that approach in this instance. Um, with regard to alternatives, it's always quite a tricky one to address. Um, the EIA regulations do require consideration of alternatives. There can be differing views on this, whether you know it's different configurations on this site, um, which is generally how this is looked at. So we can see that the um, start of the report does talk through the design iterations that have been um, considered by the developer. Um, but as with other planning applications, it's not the case that we can place significant weight on the fact that, you know, someone may think that onshore wind isn't the best option moving forward. Someone might have a preference for offshore wind, but that's not material um, for us um, when we're considering this. We have to assess what is in front of us. So um, I would say we could place limited weight <clears throat> on that particular bit of the EIA, EIA regulations. In terms of the private water supplies, um, the construction work that has um, been identified by SEPA um, is really around the construction of access tracks. So the SEPA guidance in relation to private water supplies, um, so it's part of their land use planning guidance series, and it has a couple of main uh, categories that uh, construction activity can fall within. So they work it based on the depth of construction. So if the construction work that's going to be undertaken includes excavation up to a depth of one metre, they require that the impacts upon private water supplies and other receptors be um, assessed within a 100 metre buffer zone of that work. If the um, excavation depth exceeds one metre, they ask for that to be a 250 metre buffer. Now the SEPA objection is partially uh, centred upon the fact that it was unclear as to the depth of the construction, the, which is why they have asked for this to be explored in greater detail. The additional information has confirmed that this construction depth would be um, under one metre, so the 100 metre buffer applies, um, but it would generally, in terms of that construction activity, it would be the construction or upgrading of access tracks as I understand it and that kind of construction activity would generally be capable of management through a planning condition such as a construction environment management plan which would limit and manage the risk to any private water supply through the construction activity. 
in terms of the lifespan for the development, the applicant has uh, proposed a period of 50 years. Uh, really, it's up to the applicant to propose um, whatever lifespan they want for development such as this. Um, if it were to be the case that there were concerns over the um, safe operation of the turbines, for example, um, you know, there are ways and means that we are able to mitigate against that in the past for turbine uh, for turbine applications, wind farm applications with lifespans of 30, 40 years, we have attached conditions that say if, for example, it becomes the turbines become discolored, we would have the power to request that they are replaced um, because the colour and finish is a material consideration whenever we're reaching a consideration over the landscape and visual impact. Um, but yes, um, it's really down to the developer to propose a lifespan that they wish. I would, however, caveat that by saying that lifespans for renewable energy developments are generally increasing, generally extending, and the planning service has not raised a particular concern over the 50 year lifespan. Um, the approach within MPF were, um, is generally that once these have been approved, even if they are temporary permission, the principle of development is established, which means even if these turbines were to be taken down um, or come to the end of their operational lifespan under current regulations, we would have to presume that a wind farm is acceptable in this location, notwithstanding the need to still um, assess the environmental impacts of subsequent applications. And then just in terms of the National Park, um, as they are another body, we can't really comment on why they have or haven't um, objected to the proposal. That would be for the National Park to answer. But I can simply presume that they do not consider it would have a significant impact on the integrity of the National Park or the qualities of the National Park. So I think I've answered all your questions there. Apologies if I haven't. There were rather a lot, but um, hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> no, th thank you, James. You did very well. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Githard, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And for a start, James, can I congratulate you for, for the report you've brought in front of us? It's absolutely superb, well laid out, full of technical detail. Mm -hmm. We haven't seen a turbine application for a while, and this is a, a, a big one to bring forward to. So well done to everyone involved in um, going through all the information that's in front of you and to put this report mm -hmm. together, really detailed. And maybe it's buried in the all that detail and I've missed it, but I see no discussion about the grid connection for the turbines or the best plant and how we can get that into the grid. And maybe that comes later, but we can get comment on that, that'd be good. And likewise on two matters, the, the borrow pits, which are, you said yourself, quarries, they're not borrowing the rock, I don't believe they're ever going to put it back. <laughs> um, but the we, you know, this committee a couple of years ago um, dealt with a quarry application as a separate thing um, you might hear. And similarly, just at the last meeting, we dealt with a best plant, half the size of this one as a separate application. I'm just wondering if those two things are, you know, the borrow pits and the, the, the best unit are going to come forward as separate applications later on if this goes through this stage of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the grid connection, that would be subject to a separate application process. Um, if it's an underground cable, it would require planning permission and we would be dealing with that as local authority. If it's an overhead line, um, it would require a section 37 application. As far as I'm aware, a decision hasn't been made on either yet and it would fall out with the scope of this application for us to comment on that. Um, but it's a separate consideration to what's before you today. Um, in terms of the borrow pits and uh, battery storage, they do not require further applications. They are part of this application. Um, so they are. So if there were further detail that the committee feels is particularly key in respect of those, we can consider asking for further clarification as part of a condition, but that would need to be very carefully constructed and reasoned um, as to what is required. Um, but they wouldn't be subject to further applications under this permission. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's interesting points there. Councillor Keating, please. Thank you, Marion. Um, thanks again, James. I it is a very thorough presentation. I've only got two ish questions. Um, first one's about the actual 
reasons for our decision. Um, there's six of them. Number one and three to six all look as though they are based on another body's observations and comments and objections. And I think I'm right, you're asking for delegated authority if those objections are withdrawn to, to um, then for withdraw our objection on that bullet point. So my question is, how many of those bodies are direct consultees of the ECU? And for those that are direct consultees, why are we essentially repeating their objection through our objection, if you like? Um, do we think it adds something? Are we worried that the ECU won't look at NPF4 in enough detail? I just wonder what we get for it. And, and my concern here is that by putting in a lot of things that are duplication, it, it may be it, it weakens our objection from our own shop, if you like. So I think that's my first question. And, and then picking the one objection I think is absolutely within our competence, if you like, or completely our decision, which is number two. Um, thank you very much for the photo montages. They were really helpful and, and it got you got your eye in. And I could see they, they were going around 360 degrees of the, of the ridge line. So I could certainly see that as a, a key point. But I'm also kind of conscious as I drive around Scotland, I see quite a lot of things that looked very similar that have planning permission and are up and, and operating. So I think my question would be here, is it possible, is it useful, should EIS see have other previous applications gone to ECU or gone to reporter effectively on similar basis of objection and has that been overridden? I think that's, I don't know if that is possible to give the, the committee that, but that might be interesting or useful information given the prevalence of ridgeline wind, wind turbines around Scotland. So one on, one on, one on, the, one on the five objections where it's, I'm going to call them duplicating, and then one on the one that I think is our own objection. Thanks, James. So in terms of the objections, you're absolutely right that we are reliant very much on technical consultees. Uh, these are direct consultees um, with the Energy Consents Unit, so they have carried out these with external bodies. Um, now, the reason that we are um, echoing their comments, I wouldn't say duplicating, we're echoing their comments, um, is because we have taken it a step further than the consultees, while they have objected on technical grounds, um, we have taken their analysis or their advice and we have used that to inform our policy assessment. So we have added a policy assessment against MPF4 and the LDP. Now, the reason that we have done this is because the Energy Consents Unit um, aren't all necessarily planners. They're consulting us as the local planning authority. Um, so we are viewing our role within this to provide a steer on whether it complies with land use planning policy first and foremost. So taking the example of Historic Environment Scotland, the approach that we are seeking to take there is we're looking at the um, technical advice that they have provided. They are providing the meat in terms of, you know, why are recumbent stone circles um, important? Why is, what is the impact likely to be? And why is that significant in terms of heritage we are then taking that advice and looking at the policy and saying okay the policy sets these parameters we're looking at this advice and based on that we are saying it does or does not comply with policy now there's a reason that we are being very very clear in what value we are adding to this or what our role within this is because as i've said if we object to this application it would trigger a public local inquiry and um at a public local inquiry, the council would be expected to defend its position. So while we are framing our reasons very much in terms of planning policy, because we feel we can defend that um, without um, have necessarily having the access to the technical expertise in the same way. Um, so that is why we are taking that approach. Hopefully that does make sense. Um, the value we are seeking to add is whether or not it complies with land use planning. Now, the reason that we consider it in the whole is because in a planning assessment and planning terms, if we look at MPF4 policy 11, which is the energy policy, that's our keystone policy for this really. It's the one that says um, whether or not development of this nature is acceptable. And MPF4, there's no getting away from it. 
policy 11 does say that there's high level support for renewable energy developments but that is subject to a number of other considerations and making sure that the effect of the development is um, not unacceptable now the reason we then look at what the consultees are saying it is based on their technical advice that we can come to a judgment a conclusion on whether or not the overall environmental impact of the proposal is or is not acceptable against that kind of keystone policy so hopefully that answers your kind of first question um just in terms of other proposals i can't speak to a great degree around the um outcomes in other bits of scotland but within aberdeenshire we have dealt with three um section 36 wind farms in the past five years or so so that would be Federesso wind farm it would be um glendai wind farm and uh, clash and Darick too so Federesso and clash and Darick were both extensions to existing wind farms and um, we did object to those predominantly on landscape and visual impact we did lose those um appeals largely because they were extensions um and glendai it probably has more similarity to this proposal in that it was a um, new wind farm in quite a prominent location. Um, our objection was on landscape and visual impact for Glendie, particularly as we felt it was located on the Highland Boundary Fault, quite a prominent uh, ge geographical feature, geological feature. Um, again, we did lose that um, particular argument, but that the loss in that case was more about where the planning balance lay. The significant landscape and visual impact was acknowledged, but it was felt that that proposal would generate um, enough of a benefit to overcome the harm that it would cause. Um, I would say, you know, we might be in a similar position with this one, but the differentiation I would make in this location is that this is in a much more populated area than previous ones that we have dealt with so there are a lot more receptors in the vicinity and um i would say that with the previous ones we did not bring on a landscape consultant at uh, this stage it was more when we were going to inquiry brought on a landscape consultant whereas this time around we've brought on the consultant at this stage to help us inform our assessment it is based on the advice of the consultant that um we've reached the conclusion that it's unacceptable in policy terms um because their view was that um, you know, it's not a particularly well designed proposal. It doesn't uh, have a lot of opportunity for mitigation within this landform. So the relationship between the hill and the turbines is um, perhaps more challenging than that, that which we've seen in other uh, proposals coming forward. So hopefully that answers both of your questions, Councillor. Yeah. No, well, thanks, James. Okay, so for the first one, I, I think I get it. So I'll use your language. We are echoing. But we're adding our respect of our competence, therefore it is appropriate. I get that. And number two, fair enough again, I, I take what you're saying. We've learned our lesson from previous ones, which we have all failed on. Um, and we're trying to make this as strong as we can, partly because of its prominent position, partly because of all the increased number of viewpoints. The, the, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, Thank you. Turn, but I've got... Um, Sorry, we're hearing somebody on their phone. Oh, muted yes, yeah, I've, I've, no, I've muted them, oh. Chair. I've muted them, so we'll instruct them how to unmute themselves at that stage. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bailey, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, James, for the support in the presentation today. There's a lot of information in here, um, a lot of us to take in, but I would like to try your attention to page 77, please, under 6.9.50, where it says that it's just I just want to read my clarification really. There's a bit where it says CPAV also requests several modifications to the development or justification as to why the said modifications cannot be made. It goes on to say that it mentions about the T1 to 8 and T11 to 12, which I manage of the, the turbines themselves. And it says that they are those areas are to be micro-sited. And also it goes on to mention about other uh, turbines, I guess, are to be floated in order to further mitigate impacts upon peak. Um, the next paragraph, it, it mentions that CPA requested the construction compound between T15 e and T16 floated to be floated and relocated in order to avoid excavation of over 1,500 metres cubed of peak. I was just wondering if you could really expand a wee bit upon what those terms mean about the floated and microsite and what they actually mean, but it doesn't really go into any great detail what that 
significances within the report? Mm -hmm. uh, so micrositing refers to a process whenever they get to, um, I suppose, a more detailed design stage. So what we'll find with a lot of these projects is um, if they successfully get permission, the permission will include a condition that says that they have a micrositing um, limit. And this, if you can think of this as kind of um, a limit of deviation. So there would be um, a perimeter drawn around the location of each turbine and in theory the turbine can be situated anywhere within that. The purpose of micrositing um, is to ensure that they can carry out more detailed site investigation once they have um, their permission and they can seek to further minimize the environmental impact. Now it's most commonly used for things such as peat and what you'll find is once they get their permission and they do their site investigation um, they'll be able to do it in a lot more detail um, and they will um, for example um, look to avoid areas of deeper peat that become more apparent through that further investigatory work and um, so that's kind of what micrositing refers to it's that final decision as to where exactly that is uh, the equipment is going to be located um, within a site now in the past, you know, we've had concerns about micrositing, but it is an established approach within this type of development. So it's not something that um, we feel um, is something that we can argue against. Um, so I would just maybe caution um, that kind of approach. And in terms of fluted um, construction, so as a bit of a technical matter, it would be quite outside my my day-to-day -day expertise, I would say, but fluted construction basically is a method of construction which limits the need for deep excavation. And um, beyond that, I don't really know the detail of it um, myself, but it's something that um, SEPA do promote for um, areas of peat. And it, the purpose of it is really to make sure that you do not need to excavate um, more um, material than really needs to be moved. Um, so in terms of the mitigation hierarchy, you know, you kind of have your avoidance of areas of peat as your gold standard. You don't disturb it if you can avoid disturbing it, but there may be justifications. There may be reasons why um, they cannot do this. And if they can't avoid it, the next kind of mechanism to look at is your micrositing or your uh, fluted construction. So it's all about minimizing the disturbance and minimizing the impact. And um, so that's kind of what those terms mean. So hopefully that's that's helpful um, to your understanding. Yes, thank you very much. That, that really does help a lot to, to clarify what these 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 uh, these words mean in regards to the support. So thanks very much for that. Yep. OK, thank you. We've got Councillor Benson next, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, there's a couple of questions I was wanting to ask. Um, uh, it was something you brought up earlier on about the uh, about the cost of un underground cabling um, to the grid. Shouldn't we have factored in that at the beginning? Or are we saying once we've destroyed the area, that's it? You know, uh, I, to put it br brutally. <laughs> um, the other thing is, how many people live within that um, that uh, red checked cross hatched area on the map? You could answer so, that, please. Yeah, so just taking the first question in terms of the onward connection, it's really not something that we can consider at this stage. Um, we we just don't know what is going to be proposed in relation to that, and it's really out with the scope of this application. So it's not something that we really can comment upon. Um, the developer may be able to give further um, information in terms of you know how they will reach that decision as to what kind of connection goes in. Um, but really, our role as local authority would be um, you know assessing whatever kind of application comes forward um, on that. Um, as we do with any kind of application, we can't start looking at them in terms of, you know, um, we would prefer uh, an alternative. Ultimately, what is submitted is what we have to assess. Um, and in terms of the number of people that live within uh, that hatched area, I'm afraid I don't have the answer. We generally don't um, look at that kind of information um, for planning applications. So I don't know that it would necessarily be entirely material um, to 
to this proposal. Um, but hopefully, hopefully that's helpful for the discussion moving forward. Yeah, thank you. It was just, just I think that that should have been um, thought of beforehand. The um, the connection to the grid, how we're going to do it. Um, it just seems more logical. But however, <laughs> um, we'll see what they say. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. No. Just to be clear, that might be a question for the developer when uh, when the applicant speaks, Councillor Mason. You could maybe ask him. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Councillor Grant, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah, just since it hasn't um, come up uh, again so far, I just wondered if you could perhaps elaborate a little more about the SEPA holding objection and the information being sought regarding uh, private water supplies and impacts upon carbon rich soils. Thank you. OK, yeah, the SEPA objection, as I say, there were a couple of kind of aspects to it. There was the uncertainty around the depth of excavation that would be undertaken as part of the construction work, which led SEPA to apply a larger buffer zone to the um, proposal for their interest. So they're wanting to consider the construction impacts on any water supplies within 250 metres. This resulted in the identification of the Donect um, estate collection tanks as a water supply that they wanted to have further assessment of. There was also a bit of um, disagreement over the source for that particular supply. SIPA records indicate it's fed by an underwater spring, um, whereas the submission material um, suggested it was groundwater fed. Um, so I'm aware that a private water supply risk assessment has been submitted um, as part of the further information and is currently being considered by SIPA. Um, as part of um, the ongoing work on this proposal. Uh, the second kind of issue that SEPA has raised were around inconsistencies in the peat management plan. So there were inconsistencies within the figures within that. So they were seeking clarification, which I believe um, has been included in the additional information. Um, they had also requested, um, has, as has been referenced, um, certain changes to the proposal in terms of locations and construction type. Um, and I believe that the developer has responded to that request within the additional information, whether or not that's um, work that has been agreed. Um, we will take account of that whenever we get the SEPA response or are made aware of that. We will be able to conclude whether or not we consider the proposal um, complies with policy at that point. Um, but hopefully that provides a bit of clarity on what SEPA we're looking for. Thanks, James. Just one more to finish off, if I may. Um, page 38, um, I mean, of, of course, it mentions, you know, we have NPF and the, the LDP, but, you know, the uh, the Electricity Act um, has primacy here. But it mentions NPF uh, for policy um, 11E. Uh, it's, it's quoted as mentioning where significant landscape and visual impacts are localised they would generally be considered to be acceptable, um, you, you know, in, 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 um, uh, in, in terms of providing infrastructure. Um, who determines, you know, what is uh, acceptable uh, and under the term localise? Is that purely within the remit of the ECU? So they could determine, you know, assuming they were following the NPF policy, that these impacts, you know, are, are sufficiently uh, localised that they don't you know, form any legitimate issues in terms of knocking back the, the application. Thank you. So you've managed to hit upon probably the million dollar question at the heart of all this. Um, it's a very difficult one to answer um, because landscape and visual impact is normally a core part of any public local inquiry in relation to these proposals and there's usually a lot of um, quite detailed argument about the exact nature and extent of the um, impact and whether or not it is localised. The localisation of it really does depend upon professional judgment um, I would say and in each case it will be slightly different depending upon the surrounding landscape topography and um, for example pattern of development and um, so it is very very difficult to provide a more detailed answer that is partially why we've brought on the landscape consultant at this point to get that kind of view um, and i would say that if you look within the landscape consultants comments which were appended to the report um, they do not consider the impact to be localized now in terms of how that factors into decision making moving forward. 
if a public local inquiry is called for this application, which under the current rules it would be if we object, um, effectively the case gets transferred from the Energy Consents Unit to the Directorate of Planning and Environmental Appeals, um, so the people that deal with um, planning appeals. Um, a reporter would be appointed to head up that inquiry and they are usually a professional with quite significant experience within planning or related fields. Um, and as part of that, they hold the inquiry, they hold the inquiry sessions, the hearing sessions, they consider the evidence and they produce a report which is um, given to ministers who ultimately make the decision. So it would be the professional judgment of the reporter as a, an outcome of the inquiry process which would ultimately determine the localised impact or not in this um, case. So um, it's a very good question and I'm afraid I don't have a very succinct answer for it, but hopefully that provides a bit of illumination as to the uh, process moving forward. Thanks, James. Yeah, I mean, in amidst all the, the other detail contained within the report, it did, it did just strike me as something that uh, could be open to interpretation, but thanks for the answer. OK. Thank you. Any more questions for James from members? No. So in that case, uh, thank you for now, James. And we'll invite uh, Mr. Shirley to address the committee. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, we can hear you. I will just get the timer set. Um, so we can stick to our five minutes. OK, shall I set off now then? Yes. Oh, super. Um, yes, my name is Gavin Shirley. I'm a senior development project manager at RES. RES is a British company formed in the early 1980s and is the world's largest independent renewable energy company. Our Glasgow office is the global centre which manages operational projects around the world. In Aberdeenshire, we developed and built glens of Foundland wind farm to the southeast of Huntley in 2006 and Meikle Carew wind farm just north of Stonehaven in 2013. The Meikle Carew project was one of the first projects to offer our local electricity discount scheme where local residents receive annual payments towards their electricity bills from the wind farm. With regard to the current Hill Affair proposal, as James noted earlier, reasons three to six are technical matters which can be addressed. The additional information uh, we submit live on 30th of August, and we expect we'll resolve all those points of objection. With regards to points of objection based on landscape and cultural heritage, there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference in our assessment for the scale of effect. It appears to be more a question of the acceptability of those effects in the planning balance. The site itself has excellent wind resource. It is not located within any designated area. There are residential properties in the surrounding area, but there are more than adequate setback distances from properties to limit the potential adverse impact on residential amenity, including noise, for which the project has been designed to operate under accepted conditions. The proposed turbines are average size by today's standards and operate best on exposed windy sites. These are, of course, visible, but that doesn't mean that the proposal is either unacceptable or badly designed. Although there could be visibility, Murray Council, Cairngorms National Park Authority and Aberdeen Council have raised no objection. Council's own landscape advice agrees that the proposal has been designed so that it won't impact on the qualities or integrity of the Dee Valley Special Landscape Area. Regarding cultural heritage, our assessment considered a total of 105 designated cultural heritage assets within 10K of disposal, of, only, of which only two were found to be more moderately impacted by the development. The head's objection relates to the impact on the setting of two stone circles, Christchurch and Sun Honey. Butting of Christchurch stone circle at Midmar has already been impacted by the church and graveyard developed next to it. It's also quite interesting to note that Sun Honey doesn't feature in the council's own top 10 mm -hmm. list of circles in Aberdeenshire in 2022. Furthermore, views to and from the circles are already shaped to a greater mm -hmm. or lesser extent by existing planting. And as part of the application, we are proposing enhancement to Sun Honey through improved access and signage. If consented, the project will be built out in compliance with the planning conditions that would be attached to that consent, and as per construction good practice. 
on place methods such as blastings, breakup surface rock cons or construction is likely and has been assessed for its pressure waves, not significant or would be limited in duration. Private water supplies have been assessed and following the implementation of mitigation measures, all potential impacts are considered to be of low risk, meaning risks are unlikely with a slight change in water supply predicted over very short time scales and within the bounds of normal water supply variation. Baseline surveys and environmental clerks of works would monitor the situation during construction. The Hill Affair is an open heather moorland with commercial plantation. The heather is interspersed by bracken and self seeding conifers, a requirement of national policies for biodiversity enhancement, not just management for mitigation. Part of the biodiversity enhancement that the proposed development offers includes actively controlling the spread of bracken and self seeding trees. The enhancement plan also includes the restoration of degraded peat on the site. Some felling will be required for the proposed development, and we have agreed with the next estate to not only replenish those trees felled, but also provide additional riparian planting up to a total of 42.8 hectares on the site itself, which Scottish forestry supports. There was an article in The Guardian this month that reported on data by independent energy think tank Ember, demonstrating that clean electricity is delivering for the UK. Building more wind and solar is the fastest way to bring more energy security with lower costs for consumers and less reliance on global fossil markets for gas and coal. Sorry, Mr. Dutch, I think you've only got 27 seconds left. Oh, OK, the proposed development has been assessed using industry standard calculator by FIPA and indicates that it will repay its carbon debt in approximately three years. The uh, the project is predicted to deliver to Aberdeenshire £14 million of inward investment during construction, £66 million of economic activity linked to operation and maintenance, a community benefit package worth £26.4 million over its lifetime, and £50 Sorry, million. Pounds. Just, I think mean, that's your, your five minutes are up. That's fine. Thank you. OK, thank you. Apologies for interrupting, but we do have to, to stick to the times. So, councillors... Have we any questions for Mr. Shirley? Councillor Gifford, please. Yeah, thanks. And um, thanks for the presentation, Mr. Shirley. Um, just to repeat a couple of questions that were asked uh, of, the, of the planning officer on the, the, the grid connection, uh, how you're going to get the power from the turbines and the, the best plant uh, into the grid, and why that's not in front of us just now. That would have been really useful to see, I think. Um, there was mention of the floating bases. And it's certainly a technology that's been around for a while. I went to a primary school that sat on a floating foundation, so it's a very old technology. Um, but offshore turbines that, that are floating are still attached to the seabed. So I wonder if you could explain the technology of floating bases that are still going to have to be attached to the ground in some way, I think. And last last question on fire safety. At our last meeting, we had lots of discussion about this uh, fire safety concerns around a best plant that's half the size of the one you're proposing. Just wondering what discussion you've had in the fire rescue service, because the applicant last time around was uh, stated that they were going to give training and equipment to the fire rescue service to be able so they could, were able to deal with any problems on site. Just wondering if you could confirm what discussions you've had. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Um, in terms of the grids, uh, just have to follow the process that's in place, uh, which is that a grid application is subject to um, being undertaken by the transmission owner. Uh, so we have no direct say over the grid connection. We'd have to submit our own grid application to the transmission owner who would he propose a, a connection to us and gather consent to get that and plug us in. A, the sort of consultation we've had with the, the TO to date has suggested that the grid connection is likely to be in Fetereso to the southeast and likely to be uh, a wooden overhead line pole. Um, but that, that's about as much information as I can really provide a, on, on the grid. In terms of fire risk, um, you know. So we design uh, the infrastructure to pre standards and all the, the appropriate uh, protocols required. The BES uh, has been uh, proposed down in the south central area of the site with a 
a fire break between the compound and surrounding trees and the technology is likely to be uh, sort of it's advancing uh, rapidly but at this stage we envisage it being a, a lithium-ion battery uh, cells situated containerized uh, with biosuppressant uh, within to to control that risk and um, certainly pre-construction uh, you would have more detailed design work and, and liaison with uh, the fire authorities to ensure it's all all up to standard and safe and then in terms of floating in relation to the floating the compound for example it's basically two sort of construction techniques if you, if you use the access tracks as an example, um, sort of cut or, or floating. So in a, in a cut, you would basically just excavate the ground down to the sort of bedrock uh, where you got the berm <laughs> and with floating, you effectively um, build a bit on top. So you would need to take, uh, take away the peat, for example, and, uh, and you basically have a slightly raised surface where uh, where you uh, traverse over. So I hope that uh, helps answer those questions. So if you want to come back. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, if you understand entirely that you could use floating bases for roads, I mean, effectively off float <laughs> anyway, um, and buildings, but are you saying that there's no proposals of any of the turbine bases using that floating technology? And to go back to the fire and rescue service bit, and what you're saying, you have had no discussions with them, that's fair enough. But can we get some um, commitment from you that you will have conversations about giving them sufficient training and any additional equipment they may need to deal with any issues on this site, given that it's pretty remote compared to the one we spoke about just a few weeks ago that was right near the outskirts of the village with its own fire station? Well, of course, I mean, uh, one of Res's sort of uh, mantras is uh, don't risk it and uh, absolutely undertake the sort of necessary conversations with, with the likes of fire steps and fire authorities to well, as I say make sure the uh, the plant is safe and, and make sure personnel are you know properly trained you know, to work in, in and around that environment um, the you know the turbine bases um, that would be subject to the detailed design following further ground investigation post consent and would be uh, detailed within the construction environmental management plan and associated sort of appendices, uh, which would be signed off by the, the likes of the council uh, before, we, before we started building. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Grant, please. Thank you, um, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Shirley. Just a, a couple of points. One of the things that um, I raised before. Um, I just wondered if you could perhaps provide commentary on one um, historic environment. Scotland um, has not been a <coughs> apologies. I'm just coming to the end of a call. Um, it said it's it's not been able to identify um, mitigation which would effectively reduce the level of impact and the the setting of um, you know some of the the scheduled monuments um, mentioned, and also the regulations has <coughs> states that the EIR should identify reasonable alternatives um which aren't actually in the application um so just on the basis of that and also adding in um you know the commentary from the council's landscape landscape consultant page 45 where he says i consider the approach adopted by the applicant to site selection to be ill thought out and contrary to guidance i just wondered if you could perhaps respond to that and explain the, the logic behind your selection of this particular site thank you thank you so in terms of um the landscape architect the council uh, exciting site selection um the alternatives within the EI and um, James did uh, talk about this diligently amongst other questions he answered and in terms of in terms of those regs and the alternatives typically speaking uh, the onshore wind uh, proposals 
address this directly through uh, the iterative design process that is set out uh, in great detail in the EIA report. Um, the, I mentioned during my uh, discussion that the site has no landscape designations, it has no designations at all. National Planning uh, Framework 4 Great wind farms will not be acceptable in national parks on the national scenic areas uh, and I'm considered elsewhere. And we've got this site here, which is free, obviously, of those show stoppers, but also any other designations on site. And we've worked hard to refine the design of the project in terms of reducing survey numbers, reducing heights to make a valuable project that's still um, acceptable in environmental terms. Um, so that, that's basically a, that in a nutshell, to be honest. Does that help with that sort of Yeah, that, that, that's, that's fair enough for a, your response. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Councillor Bonchi, please. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, Mr. Shirley. Uh, I got one simple question for you. What direct benefits do you see, first of all, to the local communities, and secondly, to Scotland, Scotland at large with this proposed development? Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, so, public access will be improved to and across the site. A, We'll make a permanent public car park out of the temporary compound on the east side. A access to the hill effect is a bit limited, and that will certainly save people sort of parking on the opposite side of the road and coming across and be much safer. And then, of course, we've got the additional wind farm tracks, which will be usable by the public, improving access across. I mentioned the enhancement to the culture heritage features, uh, linking up uh, some of the assets and the uh, best signage there. Our socioeconomics uh, within the planning and sustainable place statement concluded that the project will maximize net economic impact. And I mentioned the, those figures uh, such as 50 million pounds in business rate over the operational lifetime. Uh, the community benefit package worth 26.4 million pounds over, over its lifetime and uh, there'll be things like it'll be up to the community what they want to spend that on uh, but there's things like the local electricity discount scheme uh, where people get tangible uh, benefit in terms of a discount to their electricity for example the a uh, biodiversity enhancement i mentioned in terms of actually improving uh, biodiversity on the site there the uh, the carbon balance you know we'll have we've made use of the industry standard calculator by CEPA and we'll repay our carbon debt in approximately three years um, so you know we're going to be providing benefits uh, for the environment through peatland restoration uh, forestry planting, public access, socioeconomics, energy security, and climate change. And I think, uh, although we're obviously uh, have landscape and visual as one of the main areas of discussion and, and debate, uh, yes, I believe there are many uh, positive elements to this project also. Okay, thank you. Uh, you keep my comments on what you said for the discussion and our debate. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I don't see any further questions. Oh, Councillor Grant. Thanks, Chair. Uh, apologies, just to follow up on Councillor Laundrie's question there. Um, Mr Shirley, the, the, the £26.4 million um, pounds for the community benefit package, how is the, the value of that determined? That's based off a uh, Scottish Government guidance of £5,000 per megawatt of installed capacity. So with our uh, project at 105.6 uh, megawatts, 
and the 50 year life plan that's proposed, that's where we get our, our 26.4 million pounds. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So just before we move on to the next speaker, I wonder if our planner, James, do you have any comments following the, the uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the only point I would uh, bring to the committee's attention would be that when it comes to socioeconomic impacts and community benefit, um, whilst the policies within MPF4 do make reference to these factors, very limited weight can be put upon them in terms of the planning assessment. So, for example, on the community benefit, the contributions that were referenced within um, Mr. Shirley's response there would be secured on a voluntary basis. They wouldn't be secured as part of this application. Um, so um, there would be limited weight that could be placed within that. As way of broader context within this, the Scottish Government has yet to provide um, guidance in relation to community benefit in terms of either the type expected or mechanisms to secure it. And as such, um, the planning service would recommend placing little weight either positively or negatively on the topic of community benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully that is informative as you um, move on to the discussion later um, as part of this. Okay, thank you. That's that's useful advice, James. Mm -hmm. So I'll thank uh, Mr. Shirley for now, but obviously you you stay in the meeting to hear the discussion, and um, but you can make no further comment. So thank you. Okay, so, thank you for welcoming me uh, uh, this morning. Okay, the next speaker we have is a representative of Cooney, McMahon and Money Musk Community Council. Uh, Mr. Frank Murray. So within the meeting with Mr. Murray, I can invite you to address members. And uh, like the previous speaker, you will have five minutes. Uh, good good morning, Chair. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Frank Murray. I'm a resident of Midmar for 42 years. I'm a community councillor with the Clooney, Midmar and Money Musk Community Council. And as such, we uh, commissioned two surveys um, on the acceptability of this wind farm. And it was revealed that 78% of the residents of Midmar objected to the wind farm. I wish to speak on two related but different topics which may affect residents, farmers, businesses, and private water suppliers if this wind farm is constructed. There are circa 300 people, 150 homes, farms and businesses that are totally reliant on pure drinking water from the Hill of Fair. West of Ect, there is no mains water to the outlying areas. Loss of water could be catastrophic. A British geological survey titled the Vulnerability of Groundwater to Pollution and Drought classified the Hill of Fair as a highly vulnerable area. The Hill Affair consists of igneous rocks, 430 million years old, very hard, impervious to water, and only holds water in the cracks and fissures between the rocks. RES planned to use explosive blasting to create borrow pits, which are actually quarries, and estimate three blasts per day, six days a week for six months as an estimate. This will create new fissures and new cracks risking and altering the water flows to existing springs, bores, and wells. The construction of the roads, crane hard standings, turbine foundations, buildings, battery storage, and will require removal of the overburden, which is the soft carbonaceous materials, trees, heathers, grasses, peat, which acts as a giant sponge and a filter. It regulates the water flow. Stripping off the overburden exposes the underlying rock cracks and fissures to pollution from mud, silt, and allows microbiological contamination to increase. And the possibility of fuel and lubricating oil contamination. 
there is empirical evidence of this happening at other wind farms, for example, Whiteley 2, where microbiological contamination spiked in the private water supplies and public water supplies. In the 1970s, the British Geological Survey mapped the UK for uranium. The Hill of Fair was identified as a prime site containing uranium-rich bearing rock. A project to open cast the mine of the Hill of Fair was planned, but did not proceed. In 2016, the Scottish Government commissioned a feasibility study entitled the Hill of Bankery Geothermal Heat Recovery Scheme. The project was to extract geothermal heat via hot water boreholes drilled into the hot rocks. Dunest Estates are specifically thanked for their cooperation in the acknowledgement of this report. The presence of uranium, the Hill Affair, has been known for 50 years. RES do not include uranium or its hazards in their environmental impact assessment. This cannot be accidental. This omission is deliberate. Explosive blasting will shatter the uranium bearing rock, which will be mechanically excavated, transported to crushers, crushed to size, and then transported around the hill uh, to form roads, foundations, and hard standings. The crushed rock will be used for batch making concrete for turbine foundations, building foundations, etc. These operations will create uranium containing dusts which will be blown around the Hill of Fair and the Dee Farley Special Landscape Area, polluting the land and the waterways. The operations will also release radon gas. Radon gas will be dissolved into the groundwater and stay in solution until released, poisoning the groundwater. Radon gas is the second highest cause of lung cancer in non-smokers and a known hazard in this area. The Chief Planning Officer for the Scottish Government said there is nothing in Scots law to require persons working on their land but affecting others being held responsible apart from civil proceedings. What chances has the individual of success against Dunnock Estates and the RES? I request Seems the committee so, to object Mr. to the wind farm. I'm sorry, Mr. Murray, that's your five minutes up. That's fine. Okay. I'm done. Thank you. Members, you can now ask questions of the speaker, but I would just point out we've got several speakers, so try and be concise and, uh, if possible, ask your, your questions in one, in one indication. Councillor Launchy, please, your question for Mr. Murray. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Mr. Murray. A pick on uh, your concern about uranium. What is your particular concern with that? Is it radiation or is it uh, heavy metal poisoning? Both. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I thought that, that would be it. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, that was concise. Councillor Bailey, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Murray. I was just wondering if you could repeat to us what the information that you, you provided there for your five minutes. You were talking about it was available from a report you'd obtained. What was that report again, sorry? Uh, there were two. The British Geological Survey entitled Vulnerability of Groundwater to Pollution and Drought. That was the one that classified the hill of uh, as being highly vulnerable. And the second was in the 1970s, the British Geological Survey mapped the UK for uranium. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Mr. Murray? Okay, none. So thank you, Mr. Murray. So you can remain in the meeting, um, but obviously now you can't make any further comment. So we'll now move on to the next speaker, and it's Fiona Bick from Efton Scheme Community Council. So welcome, uh, Mrs Bick. Are you ready to address the committee? Yes, I am. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, my name is Fiona Bick. I live in Skeen, and I'm the chair of Efton Scheme Community Council. 
I'm here representing the communities that we serve. Our community council area lies between West Hill to the east and Hill of Fair to the west and includes the settlements of Echt and Echt, Line of Skeen and Garlogie. Whenever we look out of our windows or step out into our countryside, Hill of Fair is a prominent and distinctive feature in our views south and west. Our sense of place is grounded by its presence as our near neighbour. For us, it marks the edge of the Grampian Mountains. Its wild moorland plateau and forested slopes provide a valued local place to roam, whether on foot or by bike. And from the top, we gain a wider perspective of our beautiful countryside. I'm here to tell you that our communities overwhelmingly object to this proposal. The community councils around the hill produced a questionnaire to collect their views. We made these available at the developer exhibitions and afterwards online. 863 questionnaires were completed with 258 people completing them on both occasions. The community's response in 2022 showed 71% objecting with only 11% in favor. In 23, our questionnaire results showed an increase in 70 to 75% objecting despite developer changes being made to the turbine numbers and size. The more people understood the development, the less they liked it. The most common reason for objection was the adverse landscape and visual impact. Additional reasons were ecology, access, and inadequate economic gain. 80% of people said financial incentives would not induce them to support it. In respect of the development, landscape and visual impact, this is something that cannot be mitigated given the hill's prominence in the landscape. It's an elongated ridge surrounded on all sides by agricultural land and rural towns and villages. The questionnaire results showed that this development is strongly opposed. In general, people support renewable energy, but not in every location and not at any cost. In this case, the negative impacts arising from the prominence of the site, the size and scale of the turbines, and the significant size of the affected population outweigh any benefits of the scheme. For the large numbers of people living closest to the hill, there are additional concerns about noise and private water supply, for which the efficacy of proposed mitigation measures are uncertain, inadequate, and therefore unacceptable. I invite you to imagine how you would feel if you were to see these enormous turbines towering above where you live. The visualizations you've seen today underplay the reality. In size, they are the same order of magnitude as the hill itself. They will be extremely visually intrusive and severely diminish the hill's landscape value. There is no way to mitigate this impact. The popularity of the hill as an outdoor destination can be seen on so-called heat maps, which are available online on sites where users record their walking and cycling activities. All parts of the hill are well used at the moment, since there is an existing network of Land Rover and forest tracks right across it. People go there to enjoy the sense of wildness and the wildlife. Meekle Tap at the East End is one of the most popular circular routes. But this development will effectively block access during the long years of construction activity. The hill tracks will be made into motorways. And once the cranes, diggers and lorries have left, the wild qualities that drew people there before will have been destroyed. The Meekle Tap Viewpoint 10 slide you saw earlier has been superseded as it didn't show the access roads, the concrete crane pads and the battery storage site that will also be prominent in this view. A new visualization is available that includes these features. They make a massive difference. And our communities will not be recompensed. The developer admits the economic benefits in Aberdeenshire during construction will be temporary and minor. During the operational phase, they will be negligible. A few contracts being let for fencing and signage repairs. The so-called community benefit package would amount to less than £50 per person per year if spread across the population around the hill, with no inflationary element. We understand that the ECU has received close to 2,000 representations and the proportion objecting reflects our own survey results. On behalf of our communities, the Echton Scheme Community Council urges the committee to object 
to this entirely inappropriate development. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Fiona, and thank you for sticking to the, the time precisely. We just came to an end there. <laughs> so, any questions from members for Mrs. Bick? Not seeing any indications. Okay, thank you. So, obviously, you can remain in the meeting and hear the discussion, but you won't be able to make any further comments. So, thank you. Thank you. I'll now invite Mr. Jonathan Rose from the Hill Affair Wind Farm Information Group <coughs> to address the committee. And, Mr. Rose, you'll have five minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yes, we can hear you. So I represent Hill Affair Wind Farm Information Group. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to draw, draw your attention to six points relating to this application. We welcome the balanced nature of the council report and particularly the recommendation to object. Offweek was formed in October 22 in response to the RES proposal and has provided information and analysis to the communities around the Hill Affair. We have carried out community consultations on the proposal and have worked in partnership with others, including community councils. We have always aimed to present the facts to allow people to make up their own minds on the proposal. This has resulted in around 1,500 letters of objection to the ECU, and we believe there are more still to be uploaded to the website. We have commissioned our own independent landscape and visual impact assessment and planning reports from recognized experts and have, sub and have submitted these to the Council and the ECU. The findings of these reinforce aspects of the Council's report, but there are several points we wish to highlight and a number of questions that are unresolved. The six points are, one, landscape and visual impact. This is the primary reason for local people objecting. Hillafair dominates the surrounding areas visible from almost anywhere within 10 kilometers and providing a keen sense of place for residents and visitors. Along with Sculpey Hill, it is the gateway to Royal Deeside that provides the first impression of the highlands that millions of visitors come to see. Offshore sized turbines will be totally incongruous in this setting. Our landscape architect viewed the applicant's LDIA and concluded that the impact would not be local which means it contravenes NPF 4 section 11E2. Her report also identified significant adverse effects on visitor experience and designated scenic resources such as the Sea Valley Special Landscape Area. Point two, non-compliance with planning guidance. This development would be on the top of the hill and along the ridge line, so would not comply with Nature Scott or Aberdeenshire planning policy guidance which says wind energy developments are not compatible with prominent ridge lines, hills or sensitive skylines. Point three, impact on people who live nearby. The, hill of, the area around Hill Affair is unusually heavily populated compared with most wind farms with some 141 homes within three kilometers. The height of the turbines and the topography of the area means most of these properties would see the proposal and be subjected to noise and potentially the flicker. Our landscape architect concluded that there will be overbearing effects for a number of residents with between two kilometers and three and a half kilometers. Also, 150 homes in the vicinity of the hill have private water supplies and are at risk of future water flow quality and reliability and of pollution from the uranium and radon. These pollution risks were not identified by the developer and result from the high uranium content of the geology. This is an unresolved matter. Point four, biodiversity and nature conservation. NPF4 sets the nature crisis alongside the climate crisis. The proposal's biodiversity baseline assessment are incomplete. So the protection and enhancement required by NPF4 have not been demonstrated. This is an unresolved matter. matter. Point five, minimal local economic benefits. Res's claim of up to 150 million boosts to the local economy from the development are unproven and misleading. The EIA report states, 
the socioeconomic impacts during construction and operation were assessed as minor or negligible beneficial in Aberdeenshire and Scotland. Mm. Point six, the carbon calculation. Hoffwig consulted with an expert on these types of calculation who considered Res's approach using an out-of-date calculation, even though it's an industry standard right now, is fundamentally flawed. UK grid is rapidly decarbonizing, which the old industry standard assumes does not happen. So the construction emissions will likely never be paid back by the low carbon power produced. It doesn't have enough time. This development will not benefit climate change. And in conclusion, the Hill Affair wind farm development would have no significant economic benefit to outweigh the detrimental landscape and visual impact and the risk of significant harm to health and well-being of nearby residents. This is the wrong development in the wrong place. Sorry. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rose. And again, thank you for uh, adhering to our time limit. Members, have you any questions for Mr. Rose? I just have one. Um, I think it was going to launch it recently earlier on the number of homes in the vicinity. And I think I caught you there, Mr. Rose. You said there were 141 homes within three kilometres. Is that right? That's that's the right. That's the number that I said. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Any further questions? Okay. So thank you, Mr. Rose. And again, you can remain in the meeting, um, but you can't make any further comments. So thank you for addressing us this morning. And now move on to our next speaker, who is Ms. Colette Backwell, um, as speaking as an individual to the committee. So Ms. Blackwell, are you able to start your, your uh, session? Thank with you. The can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on issues related to Midmar and its residents. I have lived in Midmar for 17 years. Res has virtually ignored or have attempted to diminish the impact of the development on Midmar. We are the smallest community affected, but as we are closest to the Hill Affair, are likely to experience the greatest negative impact. Perhaps that is why Res has ignored us. For Midmar, you have seen viewpoint one at the junction of the B919 and the minor road to Midmar School. Taking the visualization from this point up close to the hill minimizes the visual, visual impact on Midmar. At one of the RES consultation meetings, their own software identified that all turbines will be seen from Midmar School, Midmar Hall, and all of the homes facing the hill. In a natural acoustic basin between the hill and Midmar, the noise from the turbines will be amplified. This effect has been completely ignored. Midmar sits due north of the Hill of Fair, with the sun following a trajectory from east to west across the summit of the hill. Many residents, particularly those suffering from epilepsy and migraine, fear light flicker, particularly in late autumn and winter, when the sun's trajectory sits low above the hill and will be behind the turbines. It is hard to see how this could be mitigated as the sun moves across the hill during the day. Turning to cultural heritage, in Chapter 7 of the EIS, Res attempts to minimise the archaeological significance of Midmar and some honeystone circles by selectively interpreting and downplaying current theories as to their use. At around 4,000 years old, these stone circles were built at the same time as the pyramids, and a recent paper in the journal Nature suggests that the altar stone in Stonehenge originated in northeast Scotland, further adding to the archaeological significance of our local heritage. I want to put it on the public record that we are deeply concerned about the complete lack of local democracy in the decision making on industrial energy developments of this scale. Birds, wildlife, peats, archaeology, the environment and even tourists all have statutory bodies protecting their interests. We as local people are dehumanised, described as receptors, not people, and have no statutory body to represent us, no voices other than our own. We have been repeatedly told during the past two years that you cannot listen to us, that we must address our concerns to Scottish ministers. But we elected you as our local councillors to represent us. All six community councils engaged with us have surveyed and supported us. 
and I would urge you all as our elected representatives to reinstate our local democracy by strongly objecting to this application. These are the words of local people. After 47 years enjoying this special place, I am devastated to think of it being trashed by turbines. No dark skills, skies, birds killed, peat destroyed, replaced by concrete. It's so stressful and upsetting, continuously trying to get the powers that be to understand how we feel. The hill is such an intrinsic part of my home and life here, providing a constant source of well-being in nature. The thought of this stunning landscape being destroyed by industrialization is truly heartbreaking. We feel helpless and ignored. We cannot believe that decision makers are so unaware of the science and are prepared to accept flawed energy policy. This upsets me grateful. Would each of you want to open your curtains every morning to see these monster turbines? And what of our culture? Ironically, Lewis Glassic Gibbon, who wrote Sunset Song, that generated such a passion for the Aberdeen landscape, started life at Est, where the lives of local people, the farmland and local heritage will be destroyed forever by industrialization. And from one of my neighbours, this is my safe place, where I recovered from cancer, where I share my life with my grandchildren, bringing them up to appreciate all good things in this part of Scotland. In conclusion, Res would have you believe that this development will save the planet and grow the economy. The facts are that this development is not needed, and Res's own analysis states that there will be negligible economic benefits both locally and nationally. But they call us space. We are not. It's the wrong development of the wrong scale in the wrong place. Industrial scale development such as this should not be in anybody's backyard, and we urge to object. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Blackwell. And um, it's now open to members if they have any questions. I don't see any indication of questions. Okay, so thank you, Ms. Blackwell. Um, and obviously you're welcome to stay in the meeting, um, but you can't make any further comments. So thank you for speaker to us today. We'll now move on to our next speaker, who is Louis Blackwell, um, again an individual objector, um, to address the committee. Mr Blackwell, you'll have five minutes um, and then members may ask you questions. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you fine. I started my career as an EHO, and I have a diploma in acoustic and noise control from the Institute of Acoustics. And I live in Midmar, and I'd like to talk to you about noise. Wind turbines are noisy, but I can understand why the Council Environmental Health Department said there is no issue with noise. <clears throat> because the guidance they were following, ETSU R97, is nearly 30 years mm -hmm. old, and written by the onshore wind industry for their industry at a time when turbines were much smaller. Because it is old, and perhaps because councils are still getting complaints, the four governments paid for an independent noise consultant, WSP, to review the guidance. WSP reported in February 23 and highlighted several shortcomings, and the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero have stated under freedom of information that the guidance would benefit from targeted updates and that the previous government have contracted noise consultants limited to update ETSU by spring of next year. The WSP key recommendations relate to amplitude modulation and nighttime noise levels. I do not have time to discuss amplitude modulation, which is the woomph, woomph noise they all make. However, Nighttime noise levels in ETSU are stated as 43 dB, which is ludicrously high for quiet countryside settings, whereas the World Health Organization standard is much lower at 30. The Midmar area has been recorded much lower again at around 20 and frequently much lower. An increase of 23 dB is a significant difference when you're trying to get some sleep. The noise impact assessment also uses the assumption in their calculations that the ground absorption factor is 0.5. This allows res to achieve the distances and setbacks from their turbines to houses they are stating. However, when the ground is covered in ice and compacted snow, 
The ground becomes a fully reflective surface and makes a nonsense of their noise impact assessment calculations for many weeks in the year, winter. In addition, leading edge erosion on the glades will increase noise levels with time. Why else would RES put in a suggested planning condition in respect to noise, the only one in their documents? Because they expect complaints, and there will be complaints if it goes ahead from anyone living within two to three miles of the turbine, and maybe further. I would urge the committee to apply the precautionary principle today, as stated by the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. In the same FOI response, they stated, decision makers considering applications for consent may choose to depart from existing policy and guidance if there is a rational justification for doing so. I believe what I said is rational. But if the development is pushed through against democratic principles, I would request that the council rejects the suggested condition as it is biased for the developer and that the environmental health department write a more balanced and independent one where the operator of the site isn't forewarned of complaints, where a more truthful picture of the reality can be captured and responded to quickly. One last thought, the council could consider issuing a notice under the Environmental Protection Act 1990, section 79 and 80, preventing a nuisance yet to occur from occurring. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Backwell. Any questions, members? Yeah, so, so Chair, so can, can we ask a question in the back of what's just been said there of uh, the planner of the applicant? Potentially, um, that's that would come at the, the end. The end. Yeah. What was the question? It was, no, it was possibly more a question for the, the, the planner or the developer on what you've just said there, Mr. Backwell. Oh, sure. So we'll, we'll come to that. Yeah, can I just advise that the applicant um, or the, uh, the, the representative for RES left the meeting some time ago, so we don't have them in the meeting any longer. Okay. That restricts it. We can ask them. That'll be the plan. Then the plan has to be Yeah. Great. I don't see any other indications of questions at this stage, so Mr. Backwell, you can remain in the meeting, um, but obviously you can't make any further comments, so thank you for addressing us today. I'll now invite uh, Richard Fife again, addressing us as an individual, um, and he's our last speaker today, so there will be an opportunity then for further questions. So, Mr. Fife. Oh, we'll need, you'll need to unmute yourself. Is it star six? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, Chair, I had reason to um, mute Mr. Fife because there was some um, issue with noise coming through. So if um, he can hear us at the moment, if he can use star six on his keypad, he should be able to unmute himself by doing that. If he's unable to do that, I think the only option is to go out of the meeting and rejoin oh, again. He's, he's oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Right. Welcome to the meeting. Are you hearing me right now? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a bit of a shame to become to be the last in the order of speakers, but so I apology, apologies for any kind of you know co comments which have been covered already. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Um, I've lived in Midmar all my life. I've also been, until very recently, a community councillor as well. However, I'm speaking on my own behalf. The Hill Affair is the southern boundary of the community of, of, of Midmar, and it's a stunning boundary for us. It defines our position, nestled under its northern slope, and marking uh, the start of the hills and the uh, mountains to the west. There are many reasons why this is a totally unacceptable place to build 
a wind farm. But these are the ones I'd like to draw your attention to in particular. The first one is location. To put such turbines and the scale of them on the top of a small 470 meter high hill, which is surrounded on all sides by a significant rural community, is totally inappropriate. There can be no mitigation whatsoever. Because of this, the development proposal is directly in contravention with the Aberdeenshire Local Development Plan um, under the landscape and visual and impact point of view. The height of these turbines is, as far as I'm aware, um, originally designed for uh, use offshore. And uh, so, again, to put these in, which would double the size of the hill, is, is just extraordinary. I believe there will be severe potential effects in terms of both noise and flicker. Um, and as spoken earlier on, the noise level has not been satisfactorily dealt with because of the modelling that's been used. Um, sorry, someone trying to come in on my phone there. Um, as a community councillor, for a second, it was unique to get all six community councils in our area to come together. We had lots and lots of meetings, put together the consultations and share them around the whole of the Hill Affair area. Um, I think this is a one-off. I mean, it's been extraordinary, but um, it is to be congratulated by everybody. Um, the figures have been mentioned earlier on, the consultations in 22 and 23. I would say that the uh, results for Midmar itself, which I believe is the area which will have most impact from this development, um, it was significantly higher in Midmar than uh, in other areas. Uh, the admittance by a developer that there will be virtually no long-term employment caused by the development, when weighed against the negatives which will come up, um, to me again is unacceptable. Um, I too came up with a figure of somewhere below £50 per person for um, potential monies that will be spread around the development. But again, uh, this is voluntary and it's only if the output from the wind farm reaches a particular level that that level of payment will occur. Um, so I don't think this is anything that's going to help us in particular. Um, the groundwork for this development are highly likely to disrupt or destroy the water supplies, which many of us use. There's been a lot on Dunecht water supply, quite naturally. But, I mean, I own water supply, which is on the bottom of the hill, on the north side of Hill of Fair, which supplies seven, eight houses. Um, this supply, uh, who's to say that fractures caused by uh, blowing up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, will not get rid of all these supplies? There is no mains water available, and there doesn't appear to be any uh, obligation on developers to safeguard against water supplies being lost. The significant risk of pollution by radon to existing water supplies has been covered already, but I would like to repeat it again. Many people exercise and walk and run on the Hill of Fair. There is also potential danger to them from this development from both ice throw and blade damage. These are proven to have happened at other locations. The views both to and from the Hill of Fair will be destroyed forever from every direction. Lastly, and despite assertions to the contrary, if this proposal were to go ahead, it will result in a significant loss in value to properties nearby and will undoubtedly affect the health of their inhabitants. I would urge the committee to object to this entirely inappropriate application in the strongest possible terms. Thank you very much. Okay, 
In that case, Mr. Fife, you can remain in meeting, and um, you can't make any further comment. And thank you for addressing us today. So, okay, thank you. Very much. Okay, thank you. I'll go now to our planning officer and um, see if he wants to make any comment based on any of the issues raised in the by the speakers. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of points in response. Um, first off, on the point of the perceived lack of local democracy, I would just reiterate what I stated earlier, um, that members of the public can and have taken advantage of the opportunity to make representations directly to the Energy Consents Unit. The reason, um, again, why we have not accepted representation is partially due to our role within this process as a consultee. Secondly, um, because we have no legal basis on which to accept representations. And third, that with representations made directly towards the Energy Consents Unit, it safeguards the ability of um, those individuals or groups to participate in further procedure. Um, community councils have been consulted directly by the Energy Consents Unit and have responded to the Energy Consents Unit consultation as well. So the voices have been input into that uh, process. Um, on the matter of uh, noise and the use of ETSU, um, that is the industry standard at this stage. Noise is a technical matter and I'm, uh, I am not an environmental health officer or a noise specialist, so I can offer limited advice on that, other than to say that our environmental health colleagues have considered the noise impact assessment and are satisfied with the findings. The condition that has been suggested by the developer, as I understand it, um, we would seek to um, seek to discuss that condition if it looked like we were in a position to support the application. I don't think we would necessarily be entirely satisfied with what has been proposed, but that would be subject to further discussions um, between officers as it is a technical matter. Um, likewise, the enforcement of any noise complaints. Again, we can't pre, um, predetermine the nature of any such complaints or whether the appropriate mechanism through which those could be pursued would be through uh, planning controls or via the Environmental um, Health Act. Um, the issue of property value, with much like with planning applications, property value is not a material consideration. So I would suggest to members that that is something that they cannot give consideration to within the discussion. And the issues around uranium were previously raised at other area committees, and it is something which we are um, investigating further, but there is a lack of information on which we could raise that as a concern at this stage or um, as a further reason for objection. Um, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So, members, um, any questions for the planning officer? I think that's a different Councillor Walker. <clears throat> thank you. It was just a question about uranium. I, I I know that previous area committees have raised it and you mentioned the lack of evidence, but I just wondered, is this some, something that can be explored further should a public inquiry come forward? Ultimately, the remit of the public local inquiry will be set by the reporter that heads it. Um, but if the issue of uranium has been raised through letters of representation or through um, the comments provided by area committees, um, then the reporter will have the option of exploring that as a specific topic at the um, public inquiry. But that would be for the reporter to decide. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Gifford, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, let's go back to what Mr. Backwell said on the, on the noise issue. Mm -hmm. And it is unbelievably technical. And the more I read about it, the less I understand it. I admit that freely. Um, but the guidance, as he said himself, is based on a long time ago, much smaller turbines, and most of them were in isolation. Just wonder what assessment has been done for the cumulative impact of all these turbines operating simultaneously with the, the noise reflection that was mentioned in one of the submissions. And you know, looking at all the noise associated with turbines, it's not just the mechanical 
noise from the working, it's the blade swish, it's the compression of thump when the blades tur past the, the turbine um, tower, et cetera, et cetera. I just wonder if that whole assessment has been done in the round. And the mention was there of the uh, precautionary principle, and just wonder if we get some comment on the application of that based on the information we have in front of us. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to answer very much of that question as noise is such a technical matter. It is something that um, really does fall out with my area of expertise and I wouldn't like to mislead the committee by attempting um, to begin answering that. It is something that if there are specific concerns that can be clearly defined, we can um, look um, to raise with our colleagues in environmental health, but I will say that with the um, noise assessment that has been submitted, you know, cumulative impact generally does form part of a um, noise assessment for um, this kind of proposal. Uh, conditions are generally structured in such a way to address cumulative noise impact um, to make sure um, that, you know, as more and more turbines are uh, constructed more and more wind farms are constructed, um, the, generally the approach you take is you provide or um, apply harsher and harsher penalties to account for the existing noise that's already there. Um, but I'm afraid I can't really go into much further detail on that, councillor. Can, can I ask then, if, if we're not entirely happy with the condition that's suggested, do we have an alternative form of words that might give more assurance to people who are raising this as a real concern? So, Generally, what happens is, as I've stated before, if we um, object, it triggers a public local inquiry. As part of the public local inquiry um, preparation, we will be asked to provide a list of conditions. It will be the planning officers in consultation with the key consultees will draft these. Um, the developer will generally also prepare their own list of conditions and the reporter will um, essentially as part of the um or in the past whenever we've had um inquiries uh, the reporter has held sessions specifically on conditions um to kind of discuss uh, the differences and to reach a conclusion on what uh, form of conditions to attach so i would be hesitant to commit uh one way or the other to specific conditions at this stage but um, the council would be putting forward um, suggested conditions as part of any inquiry if we get into that position. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Keating, please. Thanks, Chair. Uh, James, uh, one of the points Mr. Rose made was about the effects of grid decarbonisation and therefore the benefits of the wind farm decreasing. Um, directionally, I agree with him. Not sure I'd go as far as to say there is no benefit, but nonetheless, I think my question is simply, is that matter, the carbon benefits of this wind farm, is it a matter we could put into a view from Aberdeenshire Council, or is that just a straight ECU consideration, which would not be appropriate under planning regulations for the council to refer to? Okay, so the application itself, if you read, if you have went through the supporting information, um, or indeed uh, through the committee report in front of you, is ultimately coming down to the planning balance, and that is to say whether or not the benefits of the proposal outweigh the um, identified harm of the proposal. And within that particular argument, the case by the developer essentially seeks to promote that the payback period is so short for this development and the operational lifespan is so long that it would have a net benefit um, in terms of the amount of carbon that it would remove um, from uh, the uh, electricity generation. So very much the carbon balance is a material consideration. However, I would caveat that by saying that the approach that has been utilised is a recognised industry standard. If we were to go down the route of trying to dispute that, we would need to be very clear about what is um, wrong with the approach that has been taken, and we would need to be very clear about how it should have been done. I'm not sure that we necessarily have that um, position um, well enough articulated um, or the evidence um, behind it for us to pursue that as an additional reason, um, but it is a material consideration within the planning balance. Okay, well, thank you for that. And now, you, now you have drawn my attention to. It. I do recall seeing the payback period, and yes, that, so so it is something we can consider. And I, 
as you can guess, I had a question for Mr. Rose that I only thought of two, two speakers later. But um, if the, I mean, the grid is decarbonizing. I don't think there's any dispute on that. So if there is metrics or calculations being used that are historic, without knowing the detail, and, and maybe this is not something we can do, but directionally, it must be the case that the calculation is out of date. I'm sure it's been done correctly by the rules, but it is actually out of date as a matter of fact. And I, it, I, I guess, as it's not us making the decision, I wonder if that's just something that you might like to co contemplate and see if you want to discuss it further at ISC, who will actually make the final decision. Because I think the point is reasonable, and as I have no knowledge of how recently updated the, the grid carbon numbers are. But if they're anything more than a year or two old, I suspect, as I say, they are, they are too carboned, too carbonized for uh, the current uh, renewable portfolio. I'll leave it with you, James. It it certainly is a comment that if the committee wishes to express that is something they wish us to explore in greater detail, we can uh, take that forward as a comment um, to ISC. Um, but as I say, um, I think that the kind of um, approach that's been utilised is well recognised. It's not the case that we as a service go and uh, carry out our own calculation as it were. It is as per what is submitted. So um, if we were to question that, we would need to be very clear about um, what we are questioning in particular. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, thank you. Please. Thank you, Chair. Um, James, it's, it's a shame that Mr. Shirley has left because I would have wanted to ask if I asked him about it as well. But I'm a, a bit concerned about the, you know, the the um, reference to issues with uranium and uh, radon. And I just wondered, are, are you aware of um, this, you know, the this issue at all being addressed in the developers' uh, documentation, the the EIAR? Is there any guidance from the Scottish Government on um, you know how these risks should be addressed? Um, and based you know based on the lack of um, information that we have, um, I would assume that you know that, that this that the fact that we do have a lack of information that this should you know form a, a significant part of the council's recommended reasons for objection. I just wondered if you could expand upon that. Thank you. So at this stage, we have no evidence in front of us in terms of the EIAR or the submitted material to discuss this. It's not something that was raised through the screening or scoping process. It is an issue that has been raised by the community throughout this. So our expectation is that as it's been raised through representations, it is for the Energy Consents Unit um, to consider as part of their decision making process. Um, as a background to this, um, we did have this use or this issue raised at the Mar Area Committee, and subsequently we have went off to discuss with our colleagues in environmental health. We are currently awaiting their feedback on that to feed into our ISC report, and at that point we will be able to hopefully reach a conclusion as to whether it's something that um, is within our scope, whether it is something that we can or should be raising concerns about. But my understanding of the issue is that the remit for consideration of the uh, uranium as a naturally occurring substance lies with SEPA and how that interacts with private water supplies. It's not being raised within the SEPA response, which is why it's not been flagged within um, our report. Um, but as I say, this is something that we are actively seeking further clarity on and will incorporate within further reports. If it's something that the committee is particularly concerned about or interested in, it is something that could be raised as a comment um, to be carried forward to ISC. Yeah, that, that, thanks, James. Uh, I think uh, more information uh, for the uh, presentation to ISC would be useful. So presumably, SEPA would be aware of the deposits in the uh, in the site under discussion. I can't speak for SEPA, but I know that the issue has been raised by members of the public with SEPA subsequent to the committees. OK, so thank you. Thank you. So I think that would be a, a question, maybe a comment to put to for ISC. I know uh, in certain areas, not that far from here, in the early 90s, there were radon monitors in the houses. So um, it is something that's been looked at in the past. OK, I don't see any further questions for the planning officer just now. So members, happy to open the debate. 
obviously uh, comments for um, infrastructure services as to whether or not we agree with the planner's recommendation as written on page 90 and the conditions therein. Councillor Launchay, please. Well, since nobody wants to uh, be first, I get to open it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> right, well, a lot have been said uh, about this development, uh, taking that into account. Uh, I consider the recommendations on page 90 and 91 to be completely acceptable. I uh, agree with uh, all of them, and uh, additionally, I would like to uh, put another few points. The first point, uh, it will be up to uh, uh, the committee to decide if uh, these want to be passed on to ISC or not. First of all, uh, on the benefits, which I find uh, very light, I open the door to the applicant to detail what would be direct benefits to the communities. I think uh, what, what he said was um, not uh, satisfactory in this end. <clears throat> I have a major concern about drinking water for the residents which would be affected by that, particularly since there is no alternative. Uh, that's a very important point, I think, which we should uh, consider. Another important point, which again I consider a life and death point, is disturbing uranium, uh, which is uh, stored in the uh, in the soil of that proposed development, which would uh, expose people, residents around, visitors uh, to potentially the to risk. First of all, radiation. And after that, uh, for the uh, drink, uh, for the drinkers of the water, heavy metal uh, metal poisoning. Uh, that those are serious serious concerns. Uh, another one is ecology. Uh, it has been said that uh, rare and endangered uh, species could be affected, particularly red kites. Uh, I don't want to see that. Now. <clears throat> Another point is that Scotland uh, tourism is sold on open uh, landscapes, uh, wild, and uh, and basically on the other end, uh, this proposal is uh, proposing pardon me the pond to uh, wreck uh, the ridge. Uh, so basically, I uh, I don't I don't see that to be. Uh, reconciled by the visual impact which has been cited. Another point is that we are voted representatives by our constituents and what I find is an overwhelming opposition to this particular uh, development. Uh, indeed 78 percent has been cited by uh, one of the uh, Objector and 71% by another one. These are very high proportions, I, I would say. And the last point that I would like to add is that I consider that there is already too much renewable electricity being produced or available at this moment in time to the tune that basically some of the producers are paid huge amounts of uh, taxpayers' money to stop producing doesn't make sense for me at this point in time, particularly, to add to that. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. You've repeated some of your, your points there. Well, as I said, I'm not particularly hard up on them or whatever it is, but the committee decides. Okay, thank you. Because I grant, please. Thank you. Uh, Chair, yeah, it's uh, certainly an issue that's uh, engendered a tremendous amount of correspondence from from members of the public, as as we all know. Um, I'll, I'll I'll just be brief, but just to you know, in addition to the various um, visual impact concerns outlined um, in the in the report, 
um, you know, a concern, a, a very real concern, I think, felt by many of us is the potential impact of radon from uh, disturbed uranium. So I look forward to seeing if any any more information could, you know, on that could be included um, in the report for ISC. And if there is no information forthcoming, just the need that, you know, this has to be uh, examined in detail. Um, going forward, as it's considered by the the ECU, um, but just uh, uh, following on from that, uh, you know, I would just add that I uh, support wholeheartedly the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Keating, please. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm equally content that the recommendations go forward. I'm again happy with the, the uranium point. James, what you're mentioning about the carbon balance, and when now you point me to the payback in one, so the, the, the carbon balance and the payback in one year, it would have to be an, a massively out of date um, grid carbon calculation for a 50 year project not to pay back at some point in that time. So my understanding is National Grid does actually put out a renewable content each year. And if there was a quick calculation, I think it might be able to do it. But if it is a lot of work, I, I don't think it's probably going to be material. I, I think my other observations would be, I think your explanation, your answers of why we have one and then three to six were useful for me. And it might be useful to tease that out for the committee in the report, because it wasn't immediately obvious to me why we were effectively basing our objection on something that was going to be directly consulted on by the ECU. But I think your steer on the planning yeah dimension was helpful to me and it might be helpful to the other members of the committee. And I think as well, I think it's partly on to what Councillor Grant's point about what's local, which I think you described as the $64 million question. Mm -hmm. um, I think the fact that you've, you've, you're aware of our previous objections and overturning of our previous objections and you've learned those lessons as best you can and why you still feel that objecting again, despite previous history, we've learned everything we can and we still believe this is a prospective objection. Um, I think that would also be useful to tease out for the committee because um, that was what kind of what was in my head when I observed there was a lot of these things around and presumably some of them have also gone through the ECU despite local objections. So I think to give the committee the best advice possible that this is still uh, an objection that we believe has appropriate uh, basis and planning to make. I think that would be also useful for the committee. But as I say, supportive of what you're proposing. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mason, please. Yeah, when we, um, thank you, Chair. Um, when we receive these energy applications, um, we're never given the full picture at all um, how we're going to connect it to the grid, what other uh, implications, the water supply. I think it's uh, we've really got to look at this a bit more detail before you can make a decision on that. Um, now the the localized impact. Um, if if you go past the glens of Foundland, you can see um, it, it, all the uh, the they're all peel very quickly, but they very disappear very quickly as you leave the place. Um, so that the visual impact is very localized um what we've seen about from the picture is that these can be seen miles and miles away um so i i don't know um what everybody thinks of that but uh yeah i i i think uh the local i think we're, we're breaking mpf4 badly i think we, we should uh, look at that um thank you Okay, thank you. Councillor Walker, please. Thank you. Um, I think that the, the two reasons planners have cited uh, for refusal, reasons one and two, are strong, and any removal of consulty objections subsequently, reasons three to six, should not dilute the overall council's objection. Um, I would like to see comments, not a condition, but comments uh, about uranium so that they can be picked up further along the process. 
I think the feeling that there is a lack of community empowerment and local democracy has really focused minds and we have to acknowledge the power of work individuals and community groups have carried out. We do recognise that as we are not the determining authority, objections are not directly considered by us, but it is very welcome that the professional planning judgment is aligned with local opinion. As others have said, we've received hundreds of emails from residents and not one of them have been against alternative energy sources, but there has definitely been a consensus that this site is indeed an ill thought out proposal. So I would hope that Infrastructure Services Committee will come to the same conclusion on the 3rd of October so that local residents really do have their voices heard at a public inquiry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Gifford, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. And just to echo Councillor Walker just said there, give thanks to all the, the speakers that come in and give us their, their input today. It's, all, it's very, very useful indeed. But I think, as we've seen through some of the contributions, a lot of people who are really concerned about applications like this put in a huge amount of work and are often far better informed than we are about the problems that lie behind the application in front of us. So many thanks indeed to absolutely all of them. And I'd like to start with the first bit about the, the process. And I know it's not what we're talking about here, but I think it really is something we need to take away elsewhere. The two things I had there were on the best plant and the, and the quarries that are proposed on the site are all included inside this big application. And yet this committee has dealt with things just like that through separate applications on our own in different, in, in, for different reasons. There's something fundamentally wrong with a process that treats different the same thing differently depending on how you apply for it. And, the, and I think it does lead to, as one of the contributors said earlier, a democratic deficit where people who live locally can't deal with something locally through our local planning process. There's something fundamentally wrong about that. And I think we need to take that way to people who are higher up the pay grade than we are to see what we, we can do about it. Um, but going on to wind turbine applications. More than 30 years ago, uh, the first thing I got involved in local politics was a, a wind farm application right across the from my house at White Cairns. And when I first became a councillor, more than 17 years ago, one of the first things we dealt with on the Fermartin Air Committee, as I was on then, was the mess with farmers' turbines, which we thought were huge at that time, and now they're pretty average sized in the scale of things we're looking at. And over all that time, through both those applications and many others, the fundamentals haven't changed. It's, it's the proximity of the turbines to people, how they impact on people, how they impact on the landscape, and all the technical things that sit behind that noise, shadow flicker, uh, and all the rest of it. And we've heard, and I've read through this very detailed report, the analysis of all that, and it's pretty conclusive that this is a challenging site, to put it mildly. And I think the recommendations that others have said already are very, very strong, and we should support them wholeheartedly. This is not a good site for a, a large array of turbines like this, and there's all kinds of good evidence that support, supports that. So. Um, so my recommendation to ISC would be to accept the officer's recommendation to object to the ECU when it goes forward. And in the discussion we've had up and on about the uranium radon situation, I wonder whether we should add a, a seventh point to the to the points of objection. Um, and I have no idea about wanting to try to scribble something down if we've got it very wrong, but subject to getting the feedback that James mentioned earlier from our environmental health colleagues, Putting something along the lines of development would pose significant risk of wind and waterborne pollution if the ground that would be, would be disturbed during construction was determined to contain uranium and or radon. And I think just to mark that as a specific thing that's been raised uh, today in particular, but also in the report, and raised as an overarching concern we've picked up today. So I don't know what I was thinking about that. I think adding a seventh point of concern would certainly, from my point of view, be very useful. Thank you. I, just, I would know. say not only during construction, because if the ground is disturbed, then the water follows a different path and might have access to other uh, quantities of uh, those uh, rare elements or, metal, or heavy metals, hence or heavy metals. <clears throat> Thank you. So it's 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 not only during construction; it's during the life 
of, uh, of the whole thing. I'm bringing Anne over to you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, members. But my understanding is there's sort of three areas, the three sections to agree today. There's the recommendations that set out in the report. Uh, if you're content with those, get to go to ISC. There is a, you have six reasons. If you want an additional people. reason, then members will have to defend that reason. There has to be an evidence um, approach and you have to be able to defend that. So in terms of the, I think Councillor Giffey acknowledged there is more information to be found. So I would yeah. suggest that that could fit as a comment to the service for further information gathering in terms of reporting to ISC. If that works for you, in usual wording, Jim, as well. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I mean, that's what I mean. There's information to come back just on the basis of what we then we get back, should something additional be put in. We can leave it as open as that. Thank you, Councillor Gifford. OK, that could probably then be decided at ISC, mm -hmm. if that was necessary. Yeah. Right, now you've got to Councillor Bailey, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think this is a, as we've heard from a lot of the speakers today, they've brought up some strong points and, and issues. Um, but within the mix of this paper, we see that there, there's a lot of information here, but there's a lot of the, the fringes of the, the whole argument here being kind of obscured in a way. We don't know within that particular area we see in front of us on our map how many people are actually res residing within that area, how many people are actually being affected, how many homes have been affected. But for me, it comes down to within the report when it says that, you know, SEPA have placed a holding obstruction uh, until sometimes there's other above matters are, are actions such as a on uh, issues such as information and clarification raised by SEPA in respect to private water supplies and peak management system, uh, which have to be addressed uh, before development can be considered to comply with uh, MP4 and so on. I think that this is one of the cases where we need that clarification, we need to see that information on this. Uh, but it also brings into that aspect within SEPA that when there's ground movement in place, such as peak management system and any of the effects of water, then it does uh, bring into the aspects that we've already touched upon. And I think Councillor Gifford's absolutely right, where it brings on you know aspects of the radon and uranium uh, within that side as to how the impact of that is. And we're not getting that clear of clarification of where we lie within we, where we go with that. They, they, they identify it and where, where the risks are. So I think that where we, you know, spoke recommendations within the report here, we've also got a lot of reasons, a lot for the questions that we need to try and add and ask to, as it moves on to ISC, to try and raise on these issues, which I think are very, very important that we've all touched upon, not been clear upon, but we have identified that the issues are there. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Councillor Georgie, please. Thank you. Oops. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that Councillor Gifford raised a really important point. So I wasn't sure in terms of process if you needed a second or something just to make sure that it actually went through. I'm very happy to support what he said. And at risk of not repeating what everyone else said, I think um, Councillor Walker in particular covered a lot um, of what I did want to say. We've heard from the people um, from our residents today who have um, spoken and also we've seen the presentation um, for one of our officers and I hope that the ISC can consider um, the proposal from our officers which is from a professional standpoint and also what the community is clearly saying today and um, that's all I just wanted to add thank you. Okay, thank you. Just there quickly um, you referred to Councillor Gifford's point was that the specific point about adding an additional condition? Yeah, or, the seventh. Or just making a, a comment to ISC on that. Yeah. So, yeah, the comment. So the comment to ISC because I think Anne mentioned that. Um, yeah, that um, we would need to defend any additional. Um. So I, I was. Um. I understand it's going to ISC as a comment. Um. And I was just checking in terms of process that, if he needed a second or something, just to make sure it actually went through. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think so. All we're agreed is okay. that we've all made, them, all made our comments about it. They will be taken through to ISC. If needs be, ISC can add that additional um, 
reason for refusal once they've dealt with it. Okay, because you mentioned the seventh one. No, it's fine. It's just clarity as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, can I just check before we actually uh, conclude this and make the decision, uh, just to confirm with members that they've received the information and feel able to participate in the determination of the application? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've certainly seen a lot of information. It's, it's been fully explained, I think. Yeah. So, um, Chair, Councillor Payne wants to come in. Oh, yeah, just spotted him. Councillor Payne, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, unfortunately, I lost connection for approximately five minutes at 11.30. Um, so I uh, unfortunately will not be able to uh, partake in uh, the decision making of this application. Thank you. OK, thank you for letting us know. So, um, is there a motion and, or amendment? Absolutely not an amendment. I think I'm getting it. In the, the, definitely the comments yeah. that people are making and the opinions that we, we um, agree with the officer's recommendations as written on page 90 and 91 of the report. And the additional and comments. We would, uh, the additional comments, particularly the one where we'd like more information on the presence of uranium and radon and yeah. possible pollution risks. Um, possible update in seed for seed. That should come. Yeah. It's a holding objection. That should come. I, I don't know if you heard that, but Councillor Bailey said in the room, possible update from SIPA. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just to acknowledge again the amount of work sure. that local communities have done um, consulting with their communities, researching and really looking into the issues uh, raised by the people that they contacted and from representing their views uh, so fully and clearly uh, to the committee today. Councillor Longy, if you want to come in. Yeah, thank you very much for allowing me to come back on that uh, uh, on one point. Page 91, 10.2.1, we should seek a response from the uh, Ministry of Defence. Yes. I think that would be uh, very important as well because of the potential impact of uh, the development on uh, flying and uh, those type of things. Right, James is waiting to come in, but I think he said that, that was now in. Uh, it, Since the report went out, that well, is now in. Oh, right, OK. Oh, sorry. Well, I'll bring James in and then I'll go to Mrs. Cumming. James? Uh, yes, Chair, the MOD response is in. They have no objection subject to conditions. So that will be removed from the ISC report um, and we'll clarify that position within the ISC report. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, good, thank you. So, Mrs. Cumming, um, can you take us through our comments, please? Yeah, um, I wanted to clarify whether or not you wish to include um, some reference to carbon calculations. Uh, I had written down, explore in greater detail, the carbon calcul the calculations and um, benefit. Is that something that, that the committee wishes to put forward as a comment? Keating, you raised that. It's really to do with the carbon paper. Yes, the current, current balance. I think, as I say, Mr Rose's point is, I'm sure it's absolutely correct. And okay. what I couldn't get a sight on is how how far out of date the official process is, because there are updates, as far as I'm aware of, grid decarbonisation produced every year. So an Excel spreadsheet in five minutes should tell you whether there's a problem or not. But that's just how I would do it, and I appreciate that. It doesn't work for a planning application. So the wording I had was exploring great, explore in greater detail the carbon calculations. Is that something you want to put forward as a comment to ISC? Was the question there is, is it something that would be available? No, I, I probably, would, probably wouldn't have enough legs to get through ECU, so probably not. Yeah, things okay. about it's, it's probably okay. the it's, it'll pay back in four years or three. It, that's, that's what I'm thinking for them. It's been yeah. four or five years. It's not going to be one. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think not. Yeah, I think so. Not
Sorry, okay. Sorry, Mason, you're indicating you want to come in now. Yes, please. If, uh, <clears throat> if I can just say, I know it's not in the application at all, but I think it's very important that the um, the connection to the grid should be some some somehow uh, asked how how we're going to connect to the grid because this is going to involve pylons going right across the uh, the area. Yes. So uh, that's it. I'll get James to explain why that's why that's not in it. James. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate uh, the desire for that to be examined, but that will be subject to an application in its own right. So we wouldn't be able to comment on it within this proposal that could be seen as prejudicial to any future application. So um, we, we <laughs> wouldn't be able to do that at this stage. Can I come back on that? If if we do need to know the connection. I mean, if uh, how how come how come if, if this is all installed, all these wind uh, turbines, the the uh, the battery storage, everything, and say right, well, there's no connection. There's not going to be any connection. How how do how do you, to get around that? Well, I think that's what James is explaining. Um, it's a separate it's a separate process. The, the difficulty for developers at this stage is until they have a consented project, it is often very difficult for them to get a grid connection. The grid uh, capacity in the northeast is very constrained at this stage, which is why we're seeing the huge influx of proposals to upgrade the grid. And I'll try not to get into that too much because those are going to be separate applications in their own right. But we cannot expect developers at this stage necessarily to know where that connection point is going to be. I believe Mr. Shirley said that the indications are that it's going to be um, connecting at Federeso, but that as far as I'm aware, has yet to be confirmed. And because that's yet to be confirmed, they do not have a firm proposal for how that is going to connect, which is why it's a separate application. I appreciate the frustration, but it is about the sequence of events and sequence of applications. Um, yes. The grid won't want to commit uh, capacity to projects until they have reasonable certainty that the projects are going ahead. It's a little bit chicken and egg, but my advice would stand that we cannot um, start commenting upon grid connections at this stage. OK, thank you. Can I just remind members uh, we're moving up to one o'clock. In fact, it is one o'clock. Can we agree to suspend standing orders to complete this item? Yes. 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 Okay. Agreed. Mr Gifford, please. Yeah, just if, if it would help, Trevor, I mean, it's very frustrating. You don't see the whole picture of an application like this, but there are some turbines not five miles from here, I would think, that have been consented for years and have not got a great connection. They are two separate things, so they're not going to build it unless they've got a great connection. But one doesn't miss out with all the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, and sometimes it can take years. Being turbine silent. I don't. So back to Alison for our comments. Yes, thank you, Chair. So in terms of the wording that relates to um, the uranium and radon, I have got further information be provided to ISC to assist in identifying the risk of wind and waterborne pollution if ground is disturbed by the development. Is that the comment that you want to go forward? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah sounds all right. OK, and you've also made a comment about um, acknowledging and highlighting the work that has been done um, by local communities around about this uh, proposal. Um, again, is that a comment that you wish to put forward to ISC? Absolutely. As Very good. Yes. OK, and that is all. If you're not putting forward the carbon calculation, is there anything further that you want to specifically comment to ISC on? I mean, obviously, I've got quite a lot of information that's been provided. But what does the committee wish? Anything further to go forward to ISC? I don't think there's anything else which isn't really mentioned in the report. Um, Can't remember. Yeah, those are just the issues. Yeah. Well, uh, one of That's okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go back. Um, right. Drinking water is in the report. The uranium as well. Ecology is in the report. So yeah, okay. that's that's it. I, that's I introduced uh, already too much renewable electricity, but you can leave it away. It's fine. Uh, don't 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 get there. Don't get there. James. Sorry, Chair. Can I just uh, suggest that on the point of the radioactive material? 
could we get that prefaced perhaps with whether it falls within the remit of the council because there, there is still that question mark um, and if it does fall within the remit of the council that's when we would look at the detail as the committee has agreed uh, there and suggested there um, that's just an important clarification probably worth um, including well it should okay. it should be included so, because it's yes as I said, potentially it's a, a life and death situation, yeah. particularly with the heavy metals. But I think it is important to, with James's advice, to preface that comment with if it falls under the remit of the council. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so having heard the comments back to us from Mrs. Cumming, our members happy that these are our comments that go forward to yep. the Infrastructure Services Committee. Yes. Yes? Yep. Okay. So that concludes uh, this item. I want to thank all our speakers today um, and thank you for your patience when we sorted out our presentation at the beginning. And this concludes um, that item and we will now uh, stop the recording and go to lunch until, if I say, quarter to two, mm -hmm. 13.45. Okay, thank you.